welcome to video 7b where we're talking about ellipses and circles. So you're going to take the information you understood about parabolic characteristics and apply it to ellipses and circles. So brand new formulas come in your way. So we're going to start with um, what is our video agenda. So we need to understand the standard form of equa equations for ellipses. How do we graph them? How do we write equations given characteristics? Then we're going to learn a brand new vocab word called eccentricity. It is calculatable, so we will calculate it. But more than anything, we're going to use it in a real world context. And finally, what is the relationship from ellipses to circles? And how can we use the discriminant or just information about a conic to understand which conic it is? Is it a parabola? Is it an ellipse? Is it a circle? Or is it a hyperbola? So let's start with the standard form of equations for ellipses. Here is a snippet of the standard form. You can totally copy this down. However, this is how I present it to you. So wouldn't it be smart to get used to this? Um, if you look under Chapter 7 resources, I will have posted a PDF of the formula chart for this unit. So you can kind of see it. And under Chapter 6, the PDF uh, formula chart will be under there as well. So let's just get started on the different orientations. You can either have a horizontal matrix major axis, so your ellipse kind of looks like this, or a vertical major axis where your ellipse looks like that. And one more time, here it is in visual format. So here I have a horizontal, so I squish it hamburger style. Here I have it vertical, so I squish it hot dog style. Um, there we go. Okay, so that was a, a slide for a previous class where I provided notes, but here you go. You can snip this, you can copy this. Uh, this will be provided on a formula chart, but again, it's understanding how to use it because I will not give you information on what each characteristic means. And uh, this is a new concept as well as the major minor axis as well. Well, pretty, a lot of this is new on here, but really important is that ABC relationship. You really should know that from your Pythagorean uh, theorem from geometry, algebra one, algebra two, et cetera, et cetera. And at the beginning of our pre-calc, uh, this is not what you are truly used to seeing though. So please do note that it is a squared minus b squared, not a squared plus b squared. So let's move on to actually graphing them. So if I'm given an ellipse in standard form, x plus two over nine squared plus y minus one squared over four is equal to one. Why does this look familiar? It's because it's our standard formula and um, we did this in, that should say 7.1. You can see I use old videos, old, old PowerPoints, but that should say 7.1 or 7a. And uh, all we have to do, identify the correct direction and the major axis. So let's go back to here. What do you notice as the unique distinction between the horizontal major axis and the um, vertical major axis? And what do you notice? is when you're A squared and you're B squared, it's what's associated. So basically, it's horizontal if A is under the X, it's horizontal if A is under your um, Y, so vertical if A is under your Y. So let's jump on in. Whichever denominator is larger. So why is it A? Because A is the larger variable. We don't know what A is, you have to determine it. So in this instance, we have nine and four. Nine must be A because it's the larger one and four must be B. Uh, or technically a squared or b squared. So a is actually going to be three and four is actually nine, uh, b is actually going to be two. So since nine is greater than four, then nine must be a squared and a, three must be a. And since four is greater, less than nine, then it must be your b value or b squared value, et cetera, et cetera. So now we know we are horizontal. We get to go in and grab information that we see. We see our h value, we see our k value, we can solve for our a value, we can solve for our b value, and so on and so forth. So there's no p value associated with ellipses and circles. There are a and our b values, our denominators. So I went ahead and calculated your a and your b value. I square rooted the denominator. So we know we have plus or minus three and plus or minus two. That's such an important concept to note because the square root of nine is not three, it is plus or minus three. And this is applicable here because you have to use both. You're going to use both positive three and negative three, both positive two and negative two. So let's plug in our H and our K values. Uh, but before we can go ahead and do that, I can plug in the center, but I know I need the C value for my foci. So let's calculate that as well. So we end up with the square root of plus or minus five. Leave it that way. Do not decimal it out. And I end up with 
these values. I know my A, I know my B, and I know my C. K and H are very easy since X minus H must be equal to X plus 2. So I'll say that again. X minus 2, oh sorry, plus 2 must be equal to X minus H. Then my X's cancel out. And since 2 is equal to negative H, H must be equal to negative 2. Ta-da. Let's do our Y. Uh, y minus K must be equal to Y minus 1. The y's are going to cancel out, so negative k equals negative 1, then that means k must be equal to positive 1. Ta-da. So here's further proof. Now plug it in. Uh, neg or h plus or minus c is going to be negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 5. So guess how many foci you actually need? 2 is the correct answer. Uh, same with your vertices. Same. Uh, so here you can actually segment it out. This one would have been um, negative 2 plus the square root of 5, comma 1, and negative 2 minus the square root of 5, comma 1. But since that's just going to be left as a square root of 5, let's go ahead and leave it as plus or minus. This one can be segmented out. Same with this one. We can do 1 plus 2. We can do 1 minus 2. We can declare our major and minor axes. And now we can graph it. So we've got some new parts. So please pay attention to my graph as I go through it. So we know it is horizontal since our larger denominator is under the X. So because it's horizontal, our major axes should lie horizontal as well. And let's check it. Y equals one is a horizontal line. So we're good to go there. Your center is going to be the exact midpoint of the circle or ellipse. Your focus uh, will have to do with eccentricity and it must be on your major axis. So here you can check since uh, Y is your repeating value and your major axis is Y, we're good to go. Same with your vertices and your co-vertices. Your vertices will be on your major. Your co-vertices will be on your minor. So again, you can check major versus minor. And then that's going to be horizontal versus uh, minor or horizontal versus vertical lines. So I plug in my for center. I plug in my foci. I plug in my vertices and look at that all along the major axis. Then I plug in my minor points and guess what I get to do? I get to connect the outermost dots and ta-da, we have our ellipse. So here, just uh, so if you notice that you've got a half of a parabola, what do you notice about the foci? It's still on the inside, just like a parabola was. The rest just give you points to mark for your vertex points, and then you can connect your dots as is. It is that simple. It really is that simple. I can check it using desmos.com or anything else, and I went ahead and put in every single unique point just to prove to you we have hit every point that we should have hit. So we did a great job. Let's try one more example before you get to do it yourself. And of course, if I wanted to make my graph more precise, I would make a table and plot each and every one of those points. But let's move on to graphing this ellipse. This is a two-part question because part one, you need to first convert it to standard form. So this is also kind of a, how do I convert a uh, the regular expression into an ellipse? Well, first and foremost, how did I know I was converting it to standard form ellipse and not a parabola? Because both are squared. And then there's going to be one more thing to help us denote, but we need seven, uh, seven video 7C seven or 7.3's information to get us there. So I'm going to take this and convert it. It doesn't look like our formula, but we notice that both X and Y are squared. It is not a parabola because only one should have been squared. This is in essence what I was telling you is that hyperbolas and ellipses and technically um, circles have both an independent and dependent variable squared. Uh, we are going to make it look like the standard formula of an ellipse. So just a brief preview for tomorrow. If you have x squared over something plus y squared over something, this is going to be an ellipse or a circle. If it says minus, then it's a hyperbola. So let's go ahead and take this and convert it. First thing I want to do is get my x's on one side and my y's on the other. So that's what I go ahead and do. I group them by variable, and then we're going to see if that where that minus 3 will help us out. It may help us right now. It may not help us right now. So first and foremost, I'm just going to move it to the other side. We almost look like the formula of an ellipse, but it has to have division. So the next thing I'm going to do is factor because we have a, a repeating 4. So that makes it easy. Why didn't we factor out the X or the Y? Because we're going to eventually create a perfect factor. If you look back at the beginning of your formula chart, you see that it says X uh, plus H squared over your A squared value. And that's because you need this to be a perfect square. So I take 6 
Uh, I'm going to complete my square. I'm going to take 6, divide by 2, and then square it. And so I got 9. I'm going to take 10, divide by 2, and I square it, and I got 25. So again, what did I do? I took my B value. I divided by 2 and I squared it to get my C value. I took my B value, I divided by 2 and I squared it to get my C value. So I went ahead and didn't forget that anything I did to the left, I did to the right. So if I'm adding a 9 here, I'm also adding a 9 here. If I'm adding a 25 here, I'm also adding a 25 here. But they are the factors, so 4 times 9, we can't forget that. And then here's my 25. So I simplify from left to right. Here's a perfect factor. Here's a perfect factor. And we can just add all this up on the other side. But I still need them to be divided by something. So look in front of your x plus 3. We have um, a 4. And in front of your y minus 5, we have a 1. And in front of 64, we have, it is just 64, but it should equal one. So I divide away the right-hand side. So I divide everything by 64. We're going to butterfly that out on the left-hand side. There it is. I butterflied and I split. And then I can simplify 4 over 64. So what I did again, I took 64 and placed it under both. That's what we did the first time around. And then I recognized 4 over 64 is the division. The, the fraction 1 over 16. Now it looks like I need it to in standard form. Why did that slide repeat? So it's in standard form. So I get to go ahead and figure out, is this an ellipse circle or is it a hyperbola? Well, I warned y'all that it needs to say plus, so we're good to go. And you haven't learned the difference between an ellipse and a circle just yet, so we're going to assume it's an ellipse. Is it horizontal is my biggest denominator under the X or is it vertical? My biggest denominator is under the Y. If you said uh, 64 is greater than 16, then you recognize that it must be a vertical major axis. So we're going to plug in for our vertical formula. First, we should figure out we know our H and our K. That's nice and easy. It's in the formula. H must be negative 3 and K must be positive 5. But let's calculate our C, A, and B values. So we know 64 is A squared, so A must be plus or minus a. B squared must be 16, so B must be plus or minus 4. We're going to use the formula down below to calculate our C squared, and we're going to leave it in its square root form. So now we have these three, technically five bits of information. Let's plug in the rest. There's our foci. Leave it that way. There's our vertices. We can simplify that. There's our covertice. We can simplify that. Major axis, minor axis. Let's get graphing. So for this, if you have to use a calculator to estimate that, that's great. If you don't know the approximate value of the square root of 48, I can walk you through that very quickly. What are your nearest square roots? Well, uh, you're going to be at the square root of 36, which is 6, and the square root of 49, which is 7. And since the square root of 48 is really darn close to 7, I'm going to go ahead and call that approximately 6.9. So 5 plus 6.9 is going to be 11.9, and uh, 5 minus 6.9 is going to be negative 1.9. So that's kind of how I can approximate those values if I was on the non-calculator portion of the exam. So if you have no idea how to estimate radicals based off of the 13, you should know 1 squared all the way to 13 squared. You might want to recall that or come see me in tutoring. So let's go ahead and plug those in. We've got our uh, center. We've got our foci. We've got our vertices. We've got our co-vertices, which should go on the minor axis. And then here's our major and here's our minor axis. Connect the dots. Ta-da, you're done. So. We did it, we checked it on Desmos, and here is your opportunity to answer your own question.